Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, I have to admit that uh, Aquaman was one of my favorite heroes when I was a kid. Um, I didn't wear his outfit today, but my pants are actually made from recycled plastic bottles. So I'm going to talk today. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to get you oceanized, take you into the ocean. Uh, you're not going to get wet. You're going to probably learn more than you need to know, but uh, I hope that some of you take away some of this uh, because the ocean is a big place and there's not a lot of people that know what the heck to do ab ab about it, but we all like it. <clears throat> and so reshaping the, the, the way we think of this front yard, the water we all like, we go as a tourist, we go as a consumer, well you can impact as a consumer, you can also impact uh, through your business and that's what I want you to think about <clears throat> when we're talking today about the ocean. So I got impacted my first time when I got out of university, I was living in Japan, I was working as the first foreigner <clears throat> in this massive, uh, one of the biggest fishing companies in the world, trading seafood. And I go to Skiji Market sometimes and I said, where does all this stuff come from? Every single day, from every corner of the planet. It's impossible that this can continue, but people don't realize it. They don't know where this stuff's coming from they're just eating and going about this, and sushi is a big trend, and oh, we want to have more of that. And I said to myself, someday when I get old, er, I'm going to slow this down, and I'm going to do what I can to help solve the, this problem. A lot of what I work on is plastic, <clears throat> but uh, fishing is a big issue. So this is what we think of <clears throat> when we think of the blue planet. You always see this image filled with water. Some people say, oh, we have to save the oceans. The oceans, there's only one ocean. There's only one body of water, and it's connected to all of us. So let's look at the map in this way. And you think of the front yard as the territory, which is your coastline, which is your country, and the water in front of that is your front yard. And how do you want to protect that front yard? It has to be different than looking at like this and say, oh, it's out there, and it's that part of the the water. So today we have a situation where much of the ocean is degraded. If you've been diving, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And the challenge is how to bring, if you know the ocean space today, the big theme is a blue economy. The green economy is renewable energy and everything on land. The blue economy is how to do sustainable business in the ocean environment. But everyone is thinking, oh, this is another chance to exploit and make money and go do this stuff. And if we don't restore to back to where we should be or should have been 50 years ago, <clears throat> we're not going to be able to have this kind of scene anymore because we've already depleted all of it. <clears throat> so think about the front yard. I'm going to tell you about three uh, topics which are not even really discussed globally today. This is uh, stuff that we're sort of leading edge on this. Marshall Plan, some of you probably heard about that from World War II. It was the first time that the world got together as a team, at least much of the world, and said we're going to rebuild Europe after the World War. But we haven't joined as a team together to do something for the planet since that time. And we now need to do, or we could do this if we want, a Marshall Plan that f fixes the ocean. Insurance. <clears throat> Hong Kong is big with finance. There's a big interest in financing the blue economy. How do we help sustainable aquaculture, sustainable this and that? <clears throat> but there's a giant gap between the environmentalists who want to do this and the bankers who think uh, they need uh, certain metrics on the methodology and that is not <clears throat> coming together yet. But I have a going to talk to you about that. And then the positive externalities looking at the value that you create through yourself or your company and valuing the positiveness, not the negative cost associated with your work. So the humans are the only species in the world that pollutes. <coughs> and unfortunately, in much of the world, we don't even react when we see the pollution. This was in Lantau Island two years ago when there was effectively a solidified oil spill that came out of the Pearl River Delta in the form of plastic. People went to the beach, they went clamming, they had a good time, they didn't call anyone, they didn't pick anything up, and they assumed that this is the norm. This is not the norm, and it shouldn't be the norm. <clears throat> we're, 
when we look at ecosystem services and how much the world environment gives to us, farming, water, agriculture, fishing, you need all of that to run the business. It's worth $33 trillion. But our business <coughs> operations that run around the world every year is only worth $18 trillion. <coughs> Yet we treat the environment like it's just a nice thing to have. Oh yeah, nice to have a park over there. Really good to have a little clean river, tiny piece of space. And everything else is cement or taken away. And we need to change the way we think about that. <coughs> the old mantra, and even maybe today, was, oh, the ocean is so big, the solution to pollution is dilution. What that means is it's so big, it doesn't matter where you put in it, it will go float away, it will sink, it will dilute, it will not do anything. So essentially, this is what we're doing to the ocean today. We're just letting it <coughs> flow, get polluted. There's now 450 dead zones around the world. The biggest one is out of the Mississippi River, mostly from a nitrogen and nutrients because we need more agriculture, you need more food, you've got to grow faster, bigger, stronger because there's more people and you need to do that. But when that comes out in the rain, along with the plastic and other things, then you get this issue <coughs> and we've got all kinds of coastal development happening, <coughs> taking away the mangroves, taking away the coral, impacting the way the water system works underground, under the water, you don't have the ecosystem, you know, we see this all over Asia. And this is what is causing a big demise in the blue uh, system that we live around. 60% <coughs> of the world's population lives near the coast. And if you believe in climate change, <coughs> storms, maybe sea level rise, <coughs> if these people don't have anywhere to make a living off of that ocean, tourism is not good, fishing is not good, <coughs> and there are storm issues, the biggest challenge to humanity in the future will be when they migrate inland to do something else. And no one's even talking about that today and no one is really planning for that. You could look at Syria as a model for how that might uh, <coughs> equate. We have over $30 billion in subsidies per year going to fishing, looking for less fish, smaller fish, deeper fish, farther away fish, bigger technologies, helicopters, military equipment to find more and more fish <coughs> that basically take life away from over one billion people a day who survive on protein from the ocean. And it's not him and his dad and his mom who are doing the overfishing, it's the people in New York and Paris and Hong Kong, Tokyo, South Africa who say, oh, I want some more fish on my menu that's a different flavor than the other one instead of other kinds of food. I'm not blaming anyone, but this is the scenario that we're in. 50% of the world's uh, fishing, all protein today is aquaculture already, 50%. And that's a lot, but it doesn't mean that that's good. It doesn't mean it's taking the stress off of the fishing system or the water. If you go to plastic, some people say, wow, there's so much plastic out there. How much has been made? A few uh, just uh, visual keys on that, 800, thousand Eiffel Towers down to one billion elephants. All of the plastic that's ever been made still exists unless it was burned or incinerated in some way. It's still somewhere on the planet, either at the bottom of the ocean or landfill or somewhere else. <clears throat> the reason we have a lot of uh, plastic pollution issues is we have many countries that have unsound waste disposal. Most plastic is recyclable. You see a little label on the bottom that says recycle me but it doesn't get recycled because the system that is, does not exist in those countries. So unsound disposal means in the drain, burned in their front yard, in the river. When the rains come, that goes out, and then we have a problem. <coughs> Recycling per GNP. The richer you are as a country, the more capacity you have to collect stuff, recycle it, make use of it. But only the rich countries <coughs> have all of that capacity. All of the other countries don't have it. They might want to recycle. They might want to put things there. So if you're, an NG, uh, if you're a multinational exporting to 180 countries and your thing is recyclable only in California, <coughs> you just send it to 179 other countries and they can't recycle it. Mm, that's a tough issue for uh, sustainability. <coughs> this is something we just uh, created <coughs> on volume of air that is 
uh, encapsulated by rigid plastic. So if you think of plastic bottles, I don't know how many of you crunch them and shrink them before you put it in the bin, but most people do not do that. And when you don't do that, <coughs> and when you have a soap container, these things are made to be rigid and pliable and they don't break down easily. So if you put one ton of bottles into a truck, you can get 46,000 bottles into a truck and move it around a city and the value of that material is about $500. But if you compress it, you can get 360,000 bottles into one truck, and it's worth $4,000, and you have nine times less trucks on the road, less pollution, less traffic. And so this is a challenge for the <coughs> recycling and plastic in the cities of our world to say how the heck can we compress and grind and shrink this material if we're all gonna use it before we move it around the city to a place where it can be recycled. <laughs> this is a, a map of what the, just the plastic bottles alone would look like if they were all floating in Hong Kong Harbor in one year. 1.5 billion bottles floating from basically Lei Yu Moon <coughs> out to, uh, to the western side of Hong Kong. That's uh, yearly. That's what we're making, not to mention <coughs> the rest of the world. Rivers are a main source of uh, bleeding from plastic, you might have heard that the 10 big rivers in the world are the ones that pollute the most. That's not true. That methodology isn't quite right on that. There's thousands of rivers out there, and they're all like arteries <coughs> that go to your heart. And if you think of the heart as, uh, the, well, the ocean, think of plastic as cholesterol that goes through your veins. And if you want to stop that, go to the veins and stop the cholesterol at the source which is up here, at least <coughs> a lot easier than catching it out in the middle of the ocean. So we have an app that we made called Global Alert. It allows you to report hot spots of trash anywhere in the world's waterways. And the point is to get people motivated to reshape the way they think of their front yard. Even if their front yard is not the ocean, it can be the river, the creek, the stream, or the lake. But let's put booms and nets and catchment devices to at least stop the flow of the stuff and then people can think, oh, where did it come from? Can we stop it? Can we prevent it? Can we recycle it? <clears throat> but we're not even doing that as a planet just yet. So look at the front yard. Basically, the territory included in this space is 30 meters out from the shoreline. <clears throat> Actually, it's out from the shoreline down to a depth of 30 meters. That's where most of the life is. So if you think of your front yard <clears throat> Much of the world doesn't have the capacity to handle this waste, but we want our front yard to be something like this. Most people would like that. Think of the broken windows theory in New York, which is in the 70s when there was a lot of crime. They, they uh, painted the windows, clean, fixed the windows, painted the, got rid of all of the uh, graffiti on the trains, and people all of a sudden said, wow, I like living here. It's actually nice, and I'm not gonna throw a rock through the window. If you do the same thing with your rivers, this was in Manila, they cleaned up the whole barangay, and people are now proud to live there. They're not gonna th be the next one to throw the garbage bag of trash into the water. And this is just one visual social thing that reshaped the way that they think of their front yard and their territory, and they're proud to be living in that environment. And this is so easy to do, because trash is a visual thing. <clears throat> so take 30 meters of depth, go around the world, and our blue front yard is three times bigger than the Amazon rainforest. And when you look at the value of what you're creating with sea, sea life, you've got all kind of plants. When the plants grow, you have ecosystem, little animals, fish, and that's a giant thing for the, the nutrients and the ecosystem of the ocean. Adding oxygen, taking away CO2, taking away nitrogen, the value of growth of plants and growth of animals with protected spaces is five times better than any forest on the planet for the value it's bringing us. And no one's talking about this yet. The only people who are talking about it is a, some aquaculture to grow seaweed for some protein and some, uh, some cosmetics and things like that, maybe some fuel, maybe even turning it into plastic. But we're not out there thinking about reforesting the ocean like we would reforest a hillside if there's a fire. And this is something that's a whole new space with a great excitement 
to be putting these kind of plants in reservoirs, reserves, <coughs> into the ocean. So the Marshall Plan. What can we do as a group, as a country, as a series of countries to fix this problem? 90% of the world is uh, ocean habitat is impacted by humans today. 90% of all of the species or the main species are depleted in a major way. And so that means is we have to go backwards and give them space to regenerate before we start re-exploiting and remaking this blue economy. If you look at marine protected areas, the biomass regrowth is 400 times <coughs> greater, 400% greater, with a much bigger density of uh, species that grows there. And if we're not allowing that to happen, we're not going to have the chance to do, be able to do some of the economic growth that much of the world wants to do today because the ocean is the last frontier. <coughs> we need to be engaged in how we uh, work together. And this is all a huge opportunity in terms of um, economic employment for people and restoration of the coastlines, which so many of us need and like to use. <coughs> Blue finance and insurance. One of the problems is the bankers, the uh, environmentalists, often say we need to finance these new projects on aquaculture and mangrove restoration, coastal restoration, the bankers say, well, how much is it worth? Where is the value? How do I put a number on this? If we take insurance and we go to the hotels in Bali and we write an insurance policy and we say, you can pay a certain amount of money as a policy to protect yourself from plastic coming on the beach X number of days a year. And if it hits a certain level, we will pay you out. If you don't want to buy the policy, you don't have to buy the policy, but you take the risk that this is going to happen. What does that do? It then gets the hotels to start thinking, oh my gosh, we should work together and make sure this slew of plastic doesn't come into our space. And when that happens, the rates go down and we solve a problem. You could do the same thing with coral, and the value of coral in that area. As soon as coral is gone, you have no divers. You have no tourism. You have no snorkelers. So all of a sudden, people put a value on the protection. And then the bankers can come in and say, oh, there's some value already put on there by the insurance industry, who is inherently a little bit more innovative than the bankers are to be able to uh, <coughs> write policies against this. So we can then start funding <coughs> our front yard in a way that we're, we're, we're putting a value on the risks and the liability that pollution or lack of uh, ecosystem may cause. And I think this is a really exciting new area that we can talk about. The last thing is uh, uh, net, net benefit analysis. We did a project with Dell for Dell and a company called Algix, which makes plastic out of algae for the shoe industry. And instead of looking at the costs of their business and the damage of pollution that they cause, Dell knew that they were doing something good, but they didn't know how to value it by using recycled content in their computers, by cleaning water when they're doing this process. And we did a valuation with True Cost that showed that if you put these two companies and just their own innovations into the industry of computers and shoe industry, the value is $3.5 billion of positive benefits back to the world. And if we start thinking that way, instead of thinking, how can I do less bad? <laughs> this is thanks to Bill McDonough, who's the grandfather of the cradle to cradle and circular economy. People don't like to go downhill on a negative trajectory. So think about going uphill. How can I do more good? How can I reshape things and bring my employees, bring my customers to do more good while I'm doing my business, instead of trying to say, oh, I'm going to do a little bit less carbon today, or a little bit less pollution. The social dynamic of changing that psychologically is great. <laughs> so hopefully, doesn't matter what you do, we all touch the ocean in some way. Whether you buy, consume, tour, any business you're doing, maybe you can think of some way that you can help reshape the world with us and the ocean. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.